Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. I see some familiar faces. Uh, so thanks for uh, actually attending and wanting to listen to me for two days in a row. Appreciate that. Uh, my name is Dmitry Sitrakin. I'm an Apache Ignite PMC member, and I'm also one of the founders of GridGain, and I'm chief product officer at GridGain. I, know I oversee the product and engineering at GridGain. I've been, spent all my life pretty much, uh, I've been a coder, a developer all my life. For the past 10 years, exclusively focused on distributed systems, transactional systems and memory concurrency, etc. So uh, probably a thing or two, I know a thing or two about distributed systems and today we're going to be talking about uh, uh, how Apache Ignite, uh, the approach that Apache Ignite has to uh, in-memory distributed durable systems. So we'll talk about what Ignite is, we'll cover some key components, we'll do feature comparison, and yes, we will actually discuss the cap theorem and where Ignite falls on the, in, in the definition of the cap theorem. I've been getting a lot of questions about that. And then we'll go in detail on how Ignite durable memory works. So we'll actually dive in into page memory allocation, page seg uh, memory regions, memory segments, pages, how the pages are <coughs> structured, how the ind indexes are structured, etc. And then we'll move to Q&A. So there's a lot to cover. Try to move fast so we can have some uh, Q&A time at the end. If I move too fast and you completely lose track, let me know so I'll slow down. Uh, so I'll start from uh, saying that in Apache Ignite 2.0, uh, we actually made a shift. Apache Ignite has historically been um, uh, purely <coughs> in-memory system, and we have moved into memory-centric system. And I'll define what that means. So some of the slides, very few, maybe two, maybe uh, will repeat from yesterday's presentation. I promise that most of the slides will be different, and most of the topics will be different. But just to define what Apache Ignite is, Apache Ignite is a memory-centric system. It's a memory-centric platform that combines two main feature sets, if you will, two main uh, uh, sets of functionality. One is a distributed SQL database, and another one is an in-memory key-value data grid. And the system is asset-compliant, it's highly available, and horizontally scalable. So the combination of durability and asset compliance, the combination of persistence, uh, the, actually combination of distribution, persistence, and asset compliance make, makes Ignite fairly unique in, uh, in the industry. If you look actually how the industry has evolved for the past maybe 10, 15 years, uh, you'll notice that once you add the word distribution and persistence, you always lose asset compliance. The system becomes non-transactional. Uh, uh, the whole wave of NoSQL databases falls into this category. So the NoSQL databases are highly available, they're distributed, they're eventually consistent, they're not transactional. They'll claim that they support some different degrees of consistency, but uh, they're not transactional, period. I mean, uh, very few, they don't support this cross-partition transactions once you start digging in, and so essentially, it's very hard to achieve a high degree of consistency in those systems. So no scale systems are uh, non-transactional. If you take a look at in-memory systems, they're in-memory data grids and memory databases. Those are distributed systems in memory. They're transactional, transactional, but they're not persistent. They're not durable. They do not survive full cluster restarts. And moreover, they require that the whole data set is loaded in memory in order to become operational. So Apache Ignite is a combination of uh, 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 I would say all those approaches. You have a distributed scale database, you have a distributed in memory data grid in one product, and you have asset compliance. So that makes us fairly unique. So uh, just to take a look uh, a little deeper at what uh, uh, each of these components means, this is a distributed SQL database diagram. Again, uh, you have a distributed cluster. Every cluster has its own, every node in the cluster has its own memory space and, of course, uh, its own disk persistence. And whenever you store the data in the cluster, it will end up on some node. It will, if you have persistence enabled, mind you, you don't have to enable persistence. You can use Ignite and 
purely pure in memory mode but if you do in enable persistence the data will always end up on disk and the data that you use the most the hardest data will be in memory and you can configure it to be memory only you can configure memory to be an exact copy of the disk or you can have a disk uh, data stored on disk a lot larger than the data set you stored in memory of course you have uh, so given that it's in a scale database of course we support a scale it uh, has redundant copies so just like uh, we always have had in, in memory data grid, uh, with this component, we always also have a primary copy and a backup copy. And you can configure as many backup copies as you like. All of that redundancy, of course, happens within the same cluster. It is asset compliance. It is asset compliance, uh, and, but what makes uh, this database uh, somewhat unique is that there are a few things that are hard to support in a distributed database. One would be distributed joins, another indexes into the data. So we support both, we support distributed indexes, so our SQL is distributed and is fully aware of where, where uh, data resides. The execution plans uh, have two steps, one that executes locally on the servers and another that executes on the client side where the, it's essentially map reduced, step, the reduced step is executed on the client side. The joins uh, are also very important. Most distributed products do not support joins. You, so generally you have to implement join manually. You select from one table, grab the keys, pass one of the parameters into another table, very, uh, uh, very painful process, very slow process and inefficient process. And uh, in Ignite, you get it out of the box. Uh, joins can be collocated or non-collocated. Collocated joins mean that uh, the keys you are joining on are guaranteed to be on the same server. Uh, as a user, you control collocation. You always know what data is accessed together with what other data, so you can actually set up for, uh, for the data to reside on the same server. Those joins will work very fast. If you don't collocate, uh, then joins will be slow. Ideally, if you can collocate about 80% of your joins in a query, you are going to get good scalability, good performance. If you don't collocate at all, I would advise not to use a distributed database. You will lose on performance and you will lose on scale because you will constantly be moving data in the background between servers and that, and that actually is not, scal not a scalable approach. Uh, another component Another component that I mentioned is an in-memory data grid, uh, which essentially means that uh, we have yet another API to talk to our data. In-memory data grid supports a key value API. So everything that is stored in Ignite can be accessed uh, directly with two types of API. One is an SQL API, another is a key value API. So let's say you inserted something into Ignite using an insert statement. So you inserted a row into a table, you can access it using a select statement, or you can uh, access it using a direct key-based lookup from Ignite API. So, from a, uh, so why is key value access important? Mainly because uh, of collocated processing. I'll talk about collocated processing further down, but essentially it allows you to use API in a collocated fashion in a distributed system uh, and prevents you from moving data around, allows you to move computations around. Again, in memory data grid is also asset compliant and it supports two types of persistence. Uh, one is native Ignite persistence, in which case you just deploy a memory data grid and if you need persistence, it'll persist data to the disk on its own. And another is a pluggable third party persistence. Why is, uh, is it important to be able to plug another database into Ignite? Well, uh, uh, for most of the enterprises, actually, uh, the whole concept of in-memory computing, whole concept of memory-centric computing is, uh, is brand new. So for most of the enterprises to actually shift their architecture into in-memory is a huge step. Imagine if they also had to uh, take their data from one database and move it to another. That would be almost an impossible task. So it's important to provide uh, users with ability to do this migration in stages. And that's exactly why it's important to be able to work with an existing database uh, 
and give uh, users ability to uh, add scale, add performance, but yet still persist to their own database. Uh, the data is sacred, you don't want to lose it, you don't want to uh, change it right away at least. So uh, whenever data is accessed in, accessed in a memory data grid, if it's not there, we will automatically look it up in a third party database. Let's say it's Oracle, MySQL, or Cassandra, or Mongo. I mean, it's an abstraction layer. Uh, uh, so it's uh, for us from a nice standpoint it doesn't matter which database you use underneath so every write will happen both in memory and automatically propagated to a third party store and the read will uh, take the reverse path uh, so from uh, if it's not in, in memory then uh, it will have to be loaded from the database the only caveat here that you have to watch out for whenever you use a third party store instead of ignite native store SQL queries work only on the data that is in memory. We do not know all the data that sits in um, your uh, RDBMS database, so we cannot issue a query on it. If you use native Ignite store, native Ignite persistence, then uh, the SQL, will, SQL queries will spend both memory and disk because we control the whole data set. All right, uh, replication schemes. Uh, we Ignite support two types of replication, uh, partition replication and full replication. Uh, in partition <coughs> replication, every, there's a concept of data ownership. Every own now owns a partition. Note that this approach is different from uh, uh, sharding that most uh, probably you are familiar with. When using shard, uh, sharding approach, shards, you actually uh, have to partition based on key. You create key ranges, and then within, within the shards, you create certain replicas, etc. Here, you operate at a key level, not at a server level. So every node gets uh, <coughs> keys assigned uh, based on affinity function that is present in Apache Ignite. And uh, whenever a new topology changes, Apache Ignite will automatically repartition, automatically move some of the keys from every server to a new node. Uh, the reverse happens whenever a node leaves the cluster. But all this assignment and all the repartition happens in the background automatically. Users do not have to worry about it. Uh, and that's one of the main difference from sharding protocols because in sharding, a lot of times you would have to uh, re-shard or manually control the key ranges. Here we actually do that automatically. That is not to say that you cannot control where the key ends up. You have a full control where which server the key will finally end up on, and you have a full control of how you want to collocate the keys. But uh, only at a key level. You tell us that uh, these two keys want, uh, are collocated, and Ignite can automatically then choose a server on which server they will be collocated. So uh, you can also uh, configure a number of uh, redundant copies, backups, so, uh, and those will be both in memory and on disk. So essentially, when a, uh, you can have two, three, four copies of the same data in the cluster, but there always will be only one primary copy and the rest will be considered backups. Whenever a crash happens, if a primary fails, a backup, one of the backups will become a primary. Um, uh, switching to full replication, a full replication essentially is when every server has all the data. Obviously, the updates are much cheaper in partition case because you only update the primary copies and if you have backups, also the backups. In a replicated scenario, you have to update the whole cluster. Every time you change a key, since it's replicated to every server, you have to send uh, the update to all the servers. So uh, the replicated scenario is not efficient when you, uh, when you have frequent updates. However, it's, uh, from a read standpoint, it's more available because whichever server you go to, you will have the data sitting on that server. So uh, based on your data characteristics, uh, you have to choose whether uh, you want your data set to be fully replicated or partitioned. And it's actually uh, the decision you make uh, per data set, not per cluster. You can have, for example, 20 data sets or 20 caches stored in Ignite, maybe 15 of them will be partitioned and five replicated. So uh, you, you pick and choose what's partitioned, what's replicated. Cool thing here that uh, whenever you execute joins, joins between partition and replicated caches are collocated by default. You do not have to worry about collocation. Join between partition caches, you have to worry about collocations. You have to try to collocate the keys you're joining on. If you achieve that, the joins will execute in milliseconds because all the indexes are also kept on the same server. 
If you cannot achieve that, then you're shifting data around and that becomes very expensive. So uh, what is a memory-centric processing? Uh, there is uh, probably, if you Google for it, you'll get a few products that claim to be memory-centric. Not that many, but nobody really defines it. So I'm going to go ahead and define it. Uh, it's going to be my definition. Uh, not necessarily how uh, uh, other vendors or other projects may see it, but it's going to be pretty close. So from a standpoint of memory-centric processing, you have two types of... Uh, if you look at how data is accessed today in distributed system, you can have two types of accesses. One is when you collocate your computer with the data. You send your computation exactly to the node where the data resides, and you compute on that server. That's what I call the memory-centric ability to collocate your processing in memory uh, with the data. And the data may reside on that server either in memory or on disk, but the processing of that data will happen in memory in collocated fashion. And some distributed systems, not all, but some distributed systems do support collocated processing. The disk-centric approach is more, more fo uh, falls more into a client-server architecture. When you actually access data from a traditional RDBMS or traditional database standpoint, where you issue a query, you get the data to the client side, and you process it on the client side. There is no collocation, but there is a lot of data movement. So this is this Ignite supports both, uh, but the, the client-server approach is much less efficient than collocated approach. So the memory-centric paradigm means ability to use key-value API in a collocated fashion. So you execute your logic directly on the nodes where the data is. Logic is very cheap to move around, much cheaper than moving data around. Uh, so what kind of distributed durable systems we have today? Uh, actually, if you look for durable systems on the market, there are quite a few. But if you start narrowing down your search, uh, saying, okay, now I want not just distribution, I also want SQL, and then I want asset compliance, you get a very short list. There are not that many. Uh, Ignite is one of them. Uh, then there is a product called NuoDB, which... Uh, uh, is also distributed uh, in memory and on disk product. Both of these uh, products I would consider memory centric. Ignite supports collocated compute, and NuoDB actually has a different approach. It's a, uh, it supports only SQL access, so it does not support key value access. So the collocated approach is handled via store procedure. So you literally have to write PLSQL. Would not be my preference, but uh, it does support. The, that logic will be executed exactly on uh, the node where the data is at. And then there's a di couple of disk-centered distributed as, uh, asset systems. One is, uh, I don't know, how many of you heard about Google Spanner? All right, quite a few. So Google Spanner is a disk-centric system. It does not support collocated processing. So it actually work, it works in a traditional database uh, fashion where you, uh, your data is distributed across the cluster, but to process it, you have to first fetch it and bring it to the client side and then work with it. Same goes for CockroachDB, which is a spin off of uh, essentially a spin off of Google Spanner. I believe people that started with Google Spanner actually left and started the CockroachDB, um, uh, Cockroach Labs company. And Cockroach Labs actually is, uh, unlike Google Spanner, it's fully open source. Actually, Apache, only two products here are open source, Apache Ignite and CockroachDB, and Apache Ignite is, of course, the only one in Apache Software Foundation. So CockroachDB does not support joins yet. It does not support store procedures yet. So it's a younger product. It may become memory-centric down the road, but it's not yet memory-centric. So uh, again, another slide that you probably remember from yesterday's presentation, but it's important enough that I decided to include it for today as well. So let's actually see where Apache Ignite falls within uh, a distributed systems ecosystem. Uh, so we'll split the world into three categories. Uh, there's a traditional RDBMS databases. Then there's NoSQL, which is eventually, every time you hear NoSQL, you have to think no transactions. No SQL means no transactions. So those are uh, eventually consistent systems. So if you have a strong consistency demand, uh, need, no SQL product will, you'll have a hard time using a no SQL product. And there are in memory data grids, and also in memory databases probably will also fall into that category, but uh, it would probably be about the same. So if you look at how these uh, types of products fall into uh, 
onto the features in a distributed ecosystem, then you'll notice that uh, traditional RDBMS uh, actually supports quite a few requirements on this list. So it's consistent. It can work both in memory and on disk. It supports SQL. It supports persistence. So essentially, it actually, if you have strong consistency requirements, if you're actually moving money, working with money or working with sensitive data, traditional RDBMS will do the job. It will not scale for you because RDBMS does not scale. Uh, traditional RDBMSs don't scale. The best you can probably hope for is to deploy another server. Maybe a couple of more servers and call them a rack. Uh, I have never seen more than two or three. Uh, in a cluster and probably would not even call that a cluster, but that uh, um, kind of replication exists only for failover purposes and it's either active-active or active-passive. So whenever one server fails, uh, you uh, uh, redirect your traffic to another server. It's not a horizontally scalable approach. You cannot, as your load grows, you cannot uh, add more servers uh, to handle the load, to split the load between each other. So the only way to scale traditional RDBMS systems is to, is to scale up, not scale out. And that scaling up, of course, has its own limits. You got buy bigger bugs, buy bigger bugs. At some point, uh, it becomes kind of silly. I mean, uh, you have a huge box and then another huge box to replicate, and you're still running out of capacity. It's still, you're still hitting the ceiling with scalability. However, it's the only option uh, has been the only option for a while if you need strong consistency because distributed systems either are not durable or are not consistent. Uh, so no scale will be a highly available, horizontally scalable product that is not strongly consistent. It's eventually consistent. So it will allow your data to get uh, temporarily out of sync and that uh, it will ensure that it becomes uh, consistent later. So if you have, again, sensitive data, you will not be able to um, transact on it in a noise scale system. If you look at IMDG in memory data grid products, then you have strong consistency, you have distribution, but it's all in memory. You do not have persistence, you do not have durability. So that's where Apache Ignite comes in, in my view. Apache Ignite actually is a combination of all these three categories. One category will be, so it will support all the features on the RDMB mass front, consistent, durable, uh, and SQL. Uh, it will be horizontally scalable uh, and, uh, and uh, continuously available. And it has a key value API and co-located processing. And remember, memory centric means co-located processing. There's, you cannot get the full value out of distributed systems if you do not co-locate your processing with the data. The, uh, you should always think about that. You never plug and play your existing code and hope it will just work when you distribute it. Distributed systems require a different approach and to get the best performance, you have to collocate your processing. So and whenever you have a key value API, you possibly have a collocated processing. So Ignite actually uh, would represent a combination of all these three uh, different types of distributed system in one. And uh, an exciting topic, where do we fall on a cap? Theorem. Uh, so just uh, to refresh everybody, uh, by the way, how many people here do not know what a cap theorem is? All right, I'll explain. Uh, didn't, mean, didn't mean to put you on the spot, by the way, <laughs> but you will know what it is after today. Uh, so uh, cap, uh, it's essentially consistency. C stands for consistency, A stands for availability, and P starts for network partition tolerance. So P stands essentially for uh, brain, split brain situations in the cluster, when you actually have two, in, your cluster splits into different segments. And the whole premise of the CAP theorem is to claim that uh, only two out of three are possible. You can either be CA, CP, or AP, but you cannot be CAP, you cannot be fully CAP. So where does Ignite fall? I would certainly say that, uh, first of all, it's not an exact science. Cap theorem is very approximate, and it's, you always have to look at it not from uh, exact characteristics of the system, but from how it looks uh, to the user. For example, can you consider a system 100% available if it has five nines availability? 
In most cases, probably yes. You're not fully, for, for, there's no such thing as a 100% available system, but that's where Cap Theorem actually, de, uh, that's how Cap Theorem actually defines availability, yes? I'm sorry? How do they define Strong consistency transactions. Uh, how do they define the also, the same way? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, uh, I would say that Ignite is definitely strongly consistent, strongly CP. So, that would be an absolutely 100% CP. You will, so, what it means is, in case of any cluster failures, Ignite will always give preference to consistency versus availability. So Ignite would rather not serve data than serve an inconsistent data. So the data served by Ignite is always going to be consistent. Uh, when, uh, when it comes to uh, availability, I would say Ignite is effectively available, e effectively CA. Again, uh, it's not an exact science, and you have to look from a user standpoint. As a matter of fact, this pie chart defines uh, uh, a graph of network failures in Google Spanner. There's actually a Google, a great article online, um, I forget the author, but one of the architects of Google Spanner analyzes how, network, how Google Spanner falls into cap theorem. And again, uh, if you look at all the failures, then uh, not all failures actually even have to do with network partitioning or brain split. Most of the failures actually have nothing to do with it. For example, there's a complete cluster shutdown, uh, which your system has, uh, will never survive because uh, the cluster just goes offline. Uh, and failures like that also make your system unavailable, but they have nothing to do with uh, uh, network partition tolerance. So 52, over 50% 50 of uh, all the cluster failures in Google Spanner caused, are caused by user error. Misconfiguration, misunderstanding of uh, the feature set, et cetera. So that will affect uh, the cluster for a certain user, but that does not affect the overall Google Spanner availability. So most of the failures have nothing to do with network partitioning. There's also... Uh, Administrators uh, error, there are also uh, operational error, and in fact, only under 7% of failures would be attributed to network brain split. And even in that case, the only time, and, and it actually works uh, the same for both, for Spanner and Ignite, the only time when your system becomes unavailable is when you have. <laughs> what just happened? There you go. All right. Somebody stepped on a, th this was a full cluster outage that I, I just described. So the only time when you actually, this like dimming lights is concerning me again. The, the only time when you actually get into a split brain situation is about under 8%, seven times, 7.6% uh, of failures are caused, are caused by uh, split brain segmentation. As a matter of fact, if you look at overall uh, percentage, it's almost negligible from a user standpoint. It falls way beyond five nines. So that's why I would say that Ignite is effectively CA. From a user standpoint, users always think about Ignite as an available system. And Ignite is, not, is definitely not an AP system. Not, uh, so uh, again, it's a strongly CP but it would not be uh, strongly AP because we always prefer consistency uh, versus availability. Does this make sense? All right. So let's actually take a look at Ignite Durable Memory. Uh, I'm, again, I'm going maybe too fast, but uh, quite a few things I want to cover here. Uh, so uh, what does, uh, does Ignite Durable Memory mean? This is actually the core of, of Ignite architecture, and, it has, uh, and it's called Durable Memory because it works just like virtual memory, where you have a physical RAM and a secondary storage, but the secondary storage is durable. So it will, unlike virtual memory, secondary storage will survive cluster restarts. So the data is, if you have persistence enabled, the data that you store in memory will always end up on disk, and if your system crashes, you restart it, and uh, the system will uh, actually it supports immediate restarts because the data does not have to be loaded in memory in order for the system to be functional, and the data becomes 
uh, and the system becomes operational right away. Another cool feature that you get from dur durable memory, first of all, it's completely off heap. So all the data is stored. Uh, we moved from being on heap centric to off heap centric. There's no reason why we should uh, even influence Java heap in any way. So whenever you work with Ignite, Java heap is all yours. Uh, we store data off heap, so you have to only consider uh, what to allocate uh, for your own application because our data will be stored off heap. We also, uh, the approach is page based. So, uh, and all the pages have the same representation both in memory and on disk. This way we avoid any type of serialization and deserialization whenever a page has to be moved from disk to memory. And another cool feature you get from durable memory is automatic defragmentation. Uh, so every time when you start moving, um, start allocating pages and key value pairs in those pages, uh, because key value pairs are always different inside, you can get smaller pieces of memory that are disconnected, they're not continuous, and uh, they're sep uh, separately from each other, they're very hard to use and allocate. So every, uh, whenever that situation happens, we will automatically defragment a single page. So we never have this background defragmentation process like uh, Windows in the 90s. Uh, we actually work with, uh, uh, per or we actually defrag defragment on a per page basis. And of course, given that we're fully consistent on a persistent side, we have to now start worrying about the state on disk being consistent, and that actually requires a full, full transaction log, a right ahead log, and it also requires uh, to store it, uh, to have a main storage files on disk as well. And we'll cover how that works as well. I'll let you digest this diagram while I drink this water. So this, how, this is how Ignite uh, durable memory at a high level works. We, uh, don't worry if you don't get, you probably do not understand all the pieces. Uh, we will look into every piece separately. But just to uh, set the, uh, set some definitions, some, some terminology. The memory is split into regions. A region has a total size, size and initial size. And a region can occupy both memory and disk. Regions are split into segments. And segments are these uh, continuous blocks of memory for a region. So essentially when you allocate initial size, if you go past that, you'll be incrementing uh, the memory in uh, these sizes of segment. Segments are split into pages, which are essentially also can be swapped uh, to disk and memory, and uh, pages in their turn are responsible for storing key value pairs. They can also store index data, they can store metadata information, et cetera. So there are three types of data that we're going to cover in Ignite. One is uh, 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 the data pages, another is uh, in how indexes work, and the third is how page allocator works, and uh, how does metadata help to do page allocation, and that would be the free lists. Free list mean, mean, uh, essentially means that we keep track of free space in page memory, and, we, and I'll explain how those work as well. Uh, so let's look uh, at memory regions and segments. Uh, so again, as I mentioned, memory region is uh, something that, uh, uh, it's a region of, it's a total space you allocate to work with your data set. You can have multiple memory regions allocated for different purposes within your system. But memory region essentially is a total space and it has initial size and a, and a uh, maximum size. We start off from initial size and then uh, we, uh, as you run out of initial size, we'll add uh, more and more data to it uh, using memory segments. So you, you, let's say if you have, hypothetically speaking, a gigabyte of memory region, and let's say you have 100 of uh, megabyte size segments, we start off from 100 megabyte, when you, we run out, we add another 100 megabyte. So that would be a memory segment. So a memory segment is continuous uh, space in memory, and memory segment is uh, uh, split into pages. And a page is a fixed size page, and it can, and page works exactly how, if you're familiar with how virtual memory works, that's exactly the approach we've taken in Ignite. Uh, uh, you have a smaller space that is available in RAM, and you have a larger space that is available on disk, secondary storage. Whenever a page is looked up, 
we first look up in memory. If it's not there, we go to disk and load it from disk. Note, we, because the representation in memory and on disk are identical, uh, we never have to serialize or deserialize. Uh, uh, and uh, another thing to note is eviction. So uh, whenever you fill in the mem uh, available memory space, uh, we will use a uh, uh, random sampling algorithm to evict a certain page from memory. So every time a new page is loaded, some other page may be evicted. It's not swapped to disk. It's already on disk. So there's no reason to copy it to disk again. But uh, uh, it will be just uh, thrown away from memory. And next time it's accessed, it will be reloaded from disk. And this way, this approach actually helps us keep uh, the hot data in memory and the cold data on disk. Note, actually, that if you have backups enabled in, and in Ignite, whenever you use key, uh, Ignite APIs, the data is always accessed from uh, primary nodes. So, uh, so most of the access happens to the primary data. That will naturally shift all the back, backup data into a secondary storage to disk, which is exactly what we want. We do not want backup data to be in memory because we only need it in case of a crash. And when a crash happens, the reverse will happen. Since now backup data becomes primary, it will start uh, lazily being loaded in memory. And again, the system will warm up and performance will improve as the backups become primary. Yes, a question? Well, yeah, uh, so the question is how do you configure this thing? I mean, there's too many moving pieces. What do you do with it? So uh, most of the stuff will be configurable. You can configure page size, memory region size, initial size. Uh, there, uh, we come up with defaults that are usable in 80% of the cases. But then as you um, start using Ignite, you will have to tune and tweak certain configuration properties. To say which one is best for which uh, Use case, we can probably take it uh, offline. You can come and ask me for after the pre after the presentation. Uh, so uh, let's look at pages. Uh, so again, a page is a fixed length block. You can configure the size of the page, and uh, uh, essentially pages can be split in three types: it's either a data page, an index page, or a metadata page. Uh, the, we try to be as economical as possible when using page memory, uh, but uh, the job of the page is to store key value pairs in memory. So a page is structured in such a way that internally you will store key value pairs. This was uh, the major architectural change that actually happened in Ignite. Prior to Ignite 2.0, we were completely key value based. So even our off heap storage was allocating data in key value pairs. We did not have pages. However, adding, uh, when we started considering persistence, uh, it's important to make sure that the representation in memory and on disk are the same. And that's how you come into page based architecture. But within the page, you still have this key value uh, pairs allocated. And again, uh, pages can, uh, if it's a data page, then it stores key value pairs. If it's an index page, it uh, uh, stores B plus tree information. It does not store the data. It can cache some of the data. For example, if you're storing primitive, we will actually also directly store a primitive, uh, that same primitive inside of the index. However, uh, if, the, if, if you store complex objects, indexes will only have references to those objects. We will try to cache some of it in, within the index, but for the full value, you still have to refer to the uh, main storage. And indexes contain information are sorted and contain information how this data is linked. And there are also meta pages that uh, uh, have meta information about B plus trees and about free lists. So this is how a data page is structured. Uh, there is a header. And then there's uh, key value pairs. Know that uh, the offsets uh, are giving us a direct, direct pointer. Essentially, offsets are pointers into the page pointing to, ex uh, to exactly where the key value pair is located. Note that we store offsets on the left. The values are on the right. This way, you can add more key value pairs, and you know exactly 
where to put an offset and uh, you know exactly since you know the offset you know exactly where to store the data if we chose to store the key values pairs directly on on the left side with the offsets then every time you add uh, new page, uh, new key value pairs, you would have a mixture of offset, key va uh, values, offsets, values, would be very inefficient to access and store data that way. That way we split it in two directions, offsets coming from the left, uh, keys from the right, offsets are the pointers into the key value data that is stored within the page. So this is how B plus three index uh, looks in uh, uh, ignite durable memory. Essentially, uh, e uh, B plus three indexes are used for both primary and secondary indexes. Again, another change from ignite from a previous ignite version. We uh, never use a B plus three index for primary index. We always used a hash map. Now we switch to B plus three index, which actually is fully implemented off heap. Uh, can can reside both in memory and on disk, and is fully concurrent. The only times when a lock is acquired is when a certain uh, page is changed and only that page gets locked for a very brief period of time. All lookups are concurrent. So all the reads can be done concurrently without uh, any kind of write lock acquisition. Only uh, we will acquire a read lock and, uh, and allow concurrent access. So indexes are sorted. If it's a field, so you can, if it's a primary index, then we will sort it based on the key hash. So it's sorted based on the key hash, and the lookup happens in, uh, from a B plus three, and it happens very fast. We actually did benchmarks between uh, the new Ignite and the old Ignite, and uh, the difference was within 5%, was negligible. Of course, hash indexes will be a little faster, but B plus three indexes uh, are better structured and overall are better suited for a durable persistent system. Uh, for secondary indexes, we support uh, uh, so, uh, all the indexes can be sorted ascending uh, in ascending or descending fashion, and they can also uh, be we also support compound indexes. So you can actually group multiple fields into one index. You can also provide hints when you execute uh, a skill. If you want to ensure that a certain index gets utilized for a certain query, you can hint about it within the SQL query when you issue uh, an ignite select statement. Uh, I've seen some hands go up and down. Yes? Uh, whether B3 index, B3 actually, uh, it, it uh, architecturally it is MVCC. If it's pure MVCC in the way you think about it, not yet. Uh, so uh, that's why select statements in Ignite are not going to be are going to be atomic for now, but not yet transactional. Transactionality will come probably within two months. So we uh, actually did this in a couple of phases. The last phase will be adding this MVC, a transactional MVCC into B plus three. Nothing in B plus three is architected out. It's actually more of a main storage that has to support MVCC, and B plus three will automatically plug into it. Yes. I'm sorry, can, can you repeat the question? Oh, it's na the storage is native to Ignite. It's all happening within the same process. Uh, so, uh, no, we do not leave, uh, do we leave the GVM to access the storage? It depends. I mean, if you uh, access it through a JDBC or ODBC driver, then obviously you're accessing it from another JVM. But you can also access it from within JVM using Ignite APIs. So, uh, and you can also access it from within JVM uh, using a collocated, pro, uh, collocated compute. So I'm not sure where, where we would fall here. I think both. <laughs> uh, does that make sense? No. Oh, I see. Uh, the uh, uh, the off heap is implemented using Java unsafe. Uh, so we, uh, and if Java, for whatever reason, decides to get rid of unsafe, it's abstracted out, we'll quickly switch to direct buffers. The only reason we're using unsafe and not direct buffers is because unsafe is faster. But uh, if Java takes it out, then 
uh, Ignite will happy, be happily working over direct buffers as well. Uh, we've tried. Uh, so we ran into some compilation issues. We've compiled. I don't believe there are any issues of running with Java Knight. So unsafe, if you're asking whether unsafe is still there, unsafe is still there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, I'll, I'll move, and we can ask more questions down the road. So let's actually take a look at the path uh, that a simple get operation takes within Ignite. So we're actually doing a cache get. We're looking up a key A. So what happens next? we need to find a primary node for that key. So that's where affinity function of Ignite comes in. Uh, uh, we uh, ask it, given this key, give us a node where this key is stored. So now that we found uh, the node, we need to find the memory region on that node in order to do the lookup. And from there, we, within that memory region, we need to do a lookup into a B plus tree. As I mentioned, all the primary keys, uh, all the primary and secondary indexes are stored in B plus tree structures. So uh, we do, make, do a lookup into B plus tree for the primary keys. Uh, we did the lookup. Uh, we find the index page for this key. So essentially, whenever we do a lookup into B plus tree, we want to find the index that is responsible for this key. And index will have a reference to a data page. It does not store the data. Again, for optimization reasons, we may store a smaller portion of the data in, inside of a B plus tree. And that, for the most part, if you think about how inserts work into B plus tree, you have to, come, uh, you have to decide whether you go left or right. And uh, for that, uh, uh, for, to make that decision, you have to compare. So a lot of times, uh, just by doing, comparing first few bytes, you can already make that decision. And that's why we will pre-cache first several bytes of every piece of data inside of a B plus tree index, so we can make lookups very fast. We can traverse the tree very fast. So from index page, we will look up a data page, and from data page, we get directly to the value. So that's essentially uh, the whole process. The cache get, uh, looking up a primary node and getting to a memory region, this is the only network trip that happens here. Once we get to the node, all other operations are local. Okay, yes? Well, I mean, uh, index page will have uh, a reference to the data page uh, directly within a segment. No, but because in your scheme, there is a primary node, a memory region, but then you have to locate the new segment. Right. Yes. A segment would be, represent a continuous space inside a memory uh, where, uh, so seg segments exist in order to do increments. Right? That's the only purpose. Whenever you do an index lookup, it has an information exactly where to go. All right, free list. Uh, probably try to finish up in about three, four minutes, and then we can move to extensive set of questions, if you have any. Uh, so the purpose of free list is to track free memory. So whenever you have this memory regions and you have multiple pages, the keys go in and out. Key value pairs go in and out of this memory region. So you constantly have to keep track of how much free space you have. And that's the job of a free list. Essentially what free lists do, they actually uh, track pages of about equal free space. You can have 25% of the page free, maybe 50, maybe 75, and 100. I'm, uh, I'm sure we have more ranges, but uh, at a high level, you can think about it uh, in this fashion. And then within every bucket, if you will, you have a list or a linked list of pages to be allocated um, there. So whenever you ask for a, for a key value pair, we already know the size you're asking for. And we will return a page uh, with uh, minimal space needed. So essentially, we will look up here, uh, we'll say, okay, uh, the key value pair is actually only, is less than 25%, and we will return the minimal page that is needed to store this key value pair. This type of structure reduces network, uh, reduces uh, data fragmentation and lowers the compaction activity because we can always track how, because whenever we allocate this way, we end up into uh, better memory utilization. If we didn't have that, then every page would be a fair game and we would get into a very fragmented space. 
this uh, type of architecture allows us to defragment, essentially, to, to create less fragmentation. And even this approach will create some fragmentation we, which we will remove automatically if uh, a request is made and no and there's no way to make a more efficient allocation, then we will defragment an existing page on the fly. Uh, so persistence, uh, I'll uh, probably mention persistence quickly because uh, it's actually a very complex uh, system. It took us about almost two years, a year and a half to two years to implement. Uh, but from a high level, what do we do? So persistence is split into two types of storages. Uh, one is a main data storage, which itself, so that's, uh, for example, for cache A, for cache B, you'll have different storages, and every storage has partition files. So every partition is stored in a different file. And then you have an index file that stores all the indexes. Note that main storage is split into partitions. However, indexes are on a per node basis. We do not split indexes based on partitions simply because that would make, if you have 1,000 partitions in MapReduce process, even within the JVM would get too expensive. So it's much cheaper to actually put all indexes for a node into one file. So that uh, goes for the main storage. And uh, then there's a write ahead log. So whenever, why do we need a write ahead log? Why can't we store in uh, main, uh, main storage right away? The reason is, uh, in main storage, again, you have to be aware of a B plus three indexes and you have to store data in the right places. And you generally may not be writing to the end of the file, you may be writing to the middle of the file. So, however, uh, writing to the end of the file, appending to the file is always going to be cheaper. And that's why write ahead logs actually exist. You always append to write ahead log. You never uh, insert anything in the middle of write ahead log. So write ahead log actually will store all the transactional data, all the pages that have not been flushed to the uh, main storage yet. And then there will be a process, it's called checkpointing process, that periodically will uh, flush the dirty pages from memory into the persistent storage, after which write ahead log will be, uh, can shrink. And the, we rotate write ahead logs. You can't just create a new file all the time. That's very expensive. The, we have a write ahead log rotation, and we actually have a write ahead log archive. So old write ahead logs get stored in the archive. So quickly, how this process works, how uh, write ahead log and checkpointing works. This is a sequence diagram. Let's say we have an update. We first find a page, we mark it, mark it as dirty in RAM, in main memory, in our durable memory, and then we persist the update to the write ahead log. And then, uh, uh, then whenever a checkpointing process happens, there's a background, background checkpointing process, it will take the, dirty, uh, the pages that were marked dirty in memory and will flash them to the main storage, to the partition files. And only after the flash is completed, the write ahead log can shrink. The pages that have been flushed can shrink from the write ahead log. Note that we're not scanning write ahead log to do checkpointing. We're not going to disk to find this files. They're already in memory and they're, right, they're marked dirty. The only reason they're present in write ahead log is to provide durability. In case of a system crash, obviously we will lose dur uh, dirty pages in memory and we have to restore them from the write ahead log. Other than that, the write ahead log actually is never read. It's only written to. And uh, the checkpointing process, actually, the arrow is, uh, no, the arrow is correct. Checkpointing process is actually taking the dirty pages and copying it to the main file system. Uh, I have about one minute left. Uh, uh, we, I, I should also mention that there's also a way to, on top of all that, there's also ability to take snapshots, full snapshots and incremental snapshots. There's a way to schedule snapshots and uh, if you use Ignite, uh, if you use the management console, you can actually manage snapshots directly from there. But you can take a snapshot on a bigger topology and restore it on a smaller topology. That allows you to analyze the data. If you have a big cluster, that allows you to analyze the data and do some um, mining on it on a smaller cluster, potentially, if you don't have the bigger available. And now I can move uh, to questions. Yes? So the, 
Okay, so the question is which version of Apache Ignite has persistence? So uh, Ignite 2.0 was a major step for us because we moved into page-based architecture. It did not have persistence yet. Uh, the persistence will come in Ignite 2.1. If you're curious to get in it, we've already released it in Grid Game Professional Edition, which is based on Apache Ignite essentially master. But uh, the reason it has not been released in Apache Ignite is because uh, Grid Game has donated the persistence code to Apache Ignite, and it takes a while within the community to digest the code. The community, so community comes before release. Apache always gives priority to the community, and community has to be comfortable with the code before we release it. We already conducted a few webinars. We analyzed the code with the community. We uh, took questions. So I, I think within two, three weeks, we'll be able to release uh, Ignite to that one. All right, so you can use Ignite for uh, professional. Your game professional to that one was released yesterday. <laughs> you can be the first user. <laughs> Uh, so, no, actually, IMDB, I would say that Ignite's been kind of an IMDB even before 2.0 because we support SQL all the time. You don't need to, uh, persistence to become an in-memory database. The only reason why in-memory database are called in-memory database is because they only support one type of access. It's SQL and it's in-memory. I don't think we want to compete with in-memory database or only in-memory database. We also have persistence and we are actually competing, I would say. We think about it again as a combination of these three. So all the products that are in all these categories would be some way competing with Apache Ignite, if you will. Uh, I'm gonna take another question and then I'm, all right, last question. So you talked about off-heap configuration being default, which right. is not the case with the version that I'm using. Is this also a new thing? Is there, here you have to configure? Yes. So yeah, in Ignite 2.0 or later, you do not have to configure off heap. Off heap is the default. You actually have to configure on heap. In rare cases where you need to cache the off heap data, you can actually enable on heap storage. Uh, yes. Uh, it will span multiple pages, and then we have to keep track of that. Uh, I don't think it's made continuous. I think it's going to, it, it has a potential to be uh, in the, so the pages that uh, we would spend do not necessarily have to be attached to each other in memory. So it just, we just will contain a link to the next page if a value, key value, some key value actually spans more than one page. No, 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 you, when you, we don't have to make it continuous, we just have to make uh, the value available to the user. User does not uh, talk to us in pages. User asks for a key and gets a value back. So, the, so our responsibility is to provide a value. We provide it in a binary format by default, and uh, you can access any piece of data by the field without even having to deserialize it. And then we deserialize it if you need it in a deserialized form. Yes, another question? Have we, yeah, we have done performance measurements. We will publish Ignite uh, performance measurements. Oh, no, of course. Of course, the, uh, persistence does not come for free. Uh, so yes, uh, if you use Ignite in a pure in-memory mode, it will be faster than if you use Ignite in, uh, with persistence enabled. I'm sorry? Well, I mean, if you look at the operating systems, uh, operating system itself, whenever you write to a file, you are not immediately flashing that data to a file. So there are different sync modes that you can configure. Yes, yes, you can configure different sync modes. The strongest one will be F-Sync, of course. Are there any options to uh, compress values in the stores? Uh, 
option to compress uh, value in a key store. Now, currently, uh, no, uh, you would not compress, definitely not in memory. On disk, you uh, would probably look into it, but then it's a trade-off. I mean, I'll, I, I'm going to wait till many users ask for it because once you start compressing, you lose performance. So it's a trade-off. I want to see where the uh, car, uh, chips fall here before we start implementing it. Uh, another question? So is there API, the question is, is there API to get the data from a persistence store? So uh, just to, to enable persistence, it's a configuration flag. Nothing changes from API standpoint. So if data is in memory, we'll load it from memory. If uh, it so happens that the data is not in memory, we will automatically get it from the disk. Uh, we will, I don't know if, we, if it even makes sense to have an API to go to disk and bypass the memory. Uh, if it's an... Sure. Just allocate. Sure, got it. Just start up another Ignite process and allocate smaller memory segment. And then you'll have less in memory, more on disk. And you can access it uh, from, then most of the operations will go to disk. Any more questions? Yes? For example? Yeah, we can actually start adding indexes again. Uh, uh, this is B plus three took us a while to implement because we put it off heap. There's nothing that we could borrow from anywhere. We put it off heap and we had to make it fully concurrent. Uh, we'll again wait uh, for user requests. And uh, as they come in, we'll have to start prioritizing them. More question? Yes. Yes. So 3D Crosspoint is a new uh, type of memory that's, that is about to be released from Intel. And it's, the premise here is uh, that it's non-volatile memory, that it can also survive restarts. The truth is, uh, whenever you restart an application, it remaps the whole memory space. So you actually have to be able to map to a certain region and remap to a certain region. So that's exactly uh, that type of remapping to the same region on restart is going to be supported by page memory because pages are just uh, a pointer, like memory regions are just a pointer into memory. So we, I, I, this architecture naturally falls into this non-volatile memory use case. Uh, and over, being over on time, is there a next presenter here? Okay, then I can take, all right. Thank you guys, thanks for coming.